In 1942, the Federal Bureau of Investigation broke into the offices of a group called the American Youth Congress. It's 1942. The American Youth Congress was a progressive group at a time when that could get you branded a communist and hauled before government officials to defend yourself. At the time, the American Youth Congress was concerned with questions like why young Americans were being drafted into war at age 18, even though for every other legal thing in the country, people were not considered to have the full rights of citizenship until they turned 21. Well, when the FBI broke into their offices in 1942, they went looking for correspondence that that group had had with one very specific, notorious, anti-American revolutionary of the day, the First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt who was known for being an advocate for youth and an advocate of progressive causes, including the Youth Congress. The demand for a report on First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt's dealings with that group came directly from the director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover. It's one of the more notable examples of our top law enforcement agency in this country being used to gather potentially politically damaging, potentially embarrassing, but hardly criminal information about public figures. But it was not, of course, the last instance of that. Decades later, we're still wrestling with the legacy of J. Edgar Hoover and the fiefdom that he made of the nation's premier law enforcement organization, the FBI. Mr. Hoover kept extensive files that he called official and confidential files. They were secret documents that tracked the lives of famous and powerful people, including details about those people's lives that were not criminal, but that definitely would have been embarrassing to those famous people if they became known. Mr. Hoover kept these special files in his office, out of the mainstream of FBI business, away from the criminal investigations that were supposed to be what the FBI was doing. He kept those secret files because the secrets they contained gave him power. And as such, they were not suited to any law enforcement purpose. They were suited to his own needs. And that is called abuse of power. We now know from those uh, now released Hoover files, for example, that Mr. Hoover wiretapped President John F. Kennedy. We know that he told President Kennedy he was aware of an extramarital affair that the president was having. And then Mr. Hoover told the president which Chicago mobster Mr. Kennedy's mistress was also visiting. As the civil rights movement unfolded, J. Edgar Hoover wiretapped Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We know now that Mr. Hoover tracked Dr. King's personal life, including supposedly which day of the week he supposedly met with his mistress. Apparently it was Tuesdays. In The Secrets of the FBI, Ronald Kessler wrote that the agency duly recorded that Robert Kennedy had gone to visit his suspected extramarital sweetheart, Marilyn Monroe, shortly before she died. And all of these stories might pique the public's interest. None of them appears to have been criminal in nature. Each of them gave J. Edgar Hoover power over these public people whose secrets he harvested. He used federal law enforcement tactics and resources to gather personal and non-criminal damning information on public people, and then he lorded it over them to advance his own causes. Under J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI became a, a freelance agency sometimes used against the president, but it was sometimes for hire by the president. Like when the FBI tapped the phones of reporters that Richard Nixon didn't like. And sometimes the FBI was just used for the sake of J. Edgar Hoover's own sad, twisted little ends. When the FBI, yes, worked on crime, but under Hoover, the FBI worked on politics too. The agency's efforts on the latter undermined everything the nation needed from the FBI on the former. And that is why Congress ordered reforms for the FBI after Watergate. Investigating crime while also secretly playing politics is a combination with a bad outcome. That is one of the things that we learned from the scandal of the Nixon administration and its downfall, but also from decades of watching J. Edgar Hoover operate. Last week, we learned that retired General David Petraeus, director of the CIA, had an affair and that the FBI discovered that affair over the summer while it was looking into something else. Those revelations about General Petraeus led to protests from members of Congress that they had not been told sooner than last week, along with everyone else. They wanted to be notified about this. The ranking Democrat on the Senate Intelligence Committee, Dianne Feinstein, says that the FBI should have told Congress. It's bipartisan. The ranking Republican on the House Homeland Security Committee calls alerting Congress in an, issue, in an instance like this the FBI's obligation. Lawmakers are sure to demand answers for why they were not told what the FBI knew 
as soon as the FBI knew it. They are sure to demand answers about that later this week when White House officials are called to testify about the attack on our consulate in Benghazi. We're still wondering whether or not David Petraeus will be called to testify about that, too, despite what has happened and his resignation. Those attacks are one kind of thing, right? But the story about Petraeus is, is quite another thing. One is a matter of national and international importance. The other appears to be the unfortunate end of a decorated mili military career, the cratering of one guy's family life and maybe one woman's family life, too. Mindful of the legacy of J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI kept the embarrassing personal details of David Petraeus' private life separate from the question of whether General Petraeus broke the law. And of course, I mean, we're all human, right? We would all like to know more about the affair Petraeus, right? It has become the must-see soap opera of our national week now that the election is over and before the new Congress begins. It is way more gripping than the inaptly named fiscal cliff, right? It's apparently more riveting to the press than our decade-long war in Afghanistan where General Petraeus last served before the CIA. From senators to members of Congress to little old me and probably you, we would all like to know more about the General Petraeus scandal in the basest, most prurient, prurient possible sense. I wager that not many of us, even those hopping mad lawmakers, though, would want to go back to the days of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI uncovering personal peccadilloes and then using them for its political gain.